Creating a protective environment at school is necessary to help reduce violence. SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, uses design, management, and actionable strategies to reduce opportunities for crime to occur, to reduce fear, and to improve the overall safety of schools. Environmental design alone will not prevent all school violence, but SEPTED is a promising prevention strategy that may lead to safer schools. For more information about incorporating SEPTED principles and strategies on your campus, contact the Office of School Safety and Security by either phone or email, or visit our page at the Department of Education website. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Lynch, Operation Manager for Oklahoma State Department of Education, Office of Safety and Security. It is my privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Art Hushin, President of NICP Incorporated, a global training company. Our subject today is SEPTED. Art, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to present today on our program. Stephen, thank you. And thank you, much. thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this and the opportunity to talk about SEPTED. Uh, my background, my name is Art Hush, and I'm the president of the National Institute of Crime Prevention. Been involved with SEPTED since the uh, early 90s when I was introduced to it. Uh, it's continued to grow over time. I worked in my agency. I'm a member of the, uh, or the executive director of the U.S. SEPTED Association, past chair of the Florida Design and Crime Association, and currently I serve on the IES Security Lighting Committee. So I have an opportunity to take what we apply in SEPTED, for example, for nighttime use, including that as lighting. Uh, what I do is I conduct SEPTED training. Uh, we've been involved with this. Uh, we have our standards through the National Institute of Crime Prevention, the SEPTED professional designation. Uh, this is also certified through many post agencies, police officer standards and trainings, for example, California, Washington, Arizona, Texas, uh, uh, Michigan. So quite a few there, which is at the standard. This is also uh, American Institute of Architects. You can earn CEU credits for taking this along with the American Planning Association. So I've been involved with it for some time. It's very passionate about it. And the company has been in existence since 1999. What is SEPTED? Uh, crime prevention through environmental design. It has other names, uh, secure by design or safe by design. But in 1971, a criminologist by the name of C. Ray Jeffrey came up with this concept and he called it SEPTED crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, we see it now codified in several requirements for cities. Uh, we see it now for school districts. Uh, but SEPTED is pretty much how I work with the environment and come up with crime prevention strategies to uh, have an impact on that negative activity or just the feeling of safety as you use that space. How would SEPTED principles benefit the average person? We think about corporations, we think about parks, we think about schools, but this is something I can apply at my home. This is something I can apply where my kids go to school, my house of worship, my neighborhood park. All these principles overlap. So whether I'm doing it for a uh, large school district or I'm doing it for my apartment complex, my condos, or my home, I can apply these strategies right across the board. Can I see my neighbors? What do I see when I'm sitting on my back porch? Uh, what about the lighting for my driveway when I come in? What about my windows? These are all things I can use every day when I'm home, not only there, but at work as well. How would SEPTED principles benefit a school leader or staff members? Yeah, this is a, a good approach because it all starts with the individual, you know, that it can be the leader, but it's the staff member as well, because they see what's taking place every day on that campus. So because they understand the concepts of SEPTED, they can start thinking about how they use their space from their classroom to the gym, to the dressing rooms, to the parking lot. They start at, well, I don't feel safe walking across the street because there's no designated path. So they recognize that and they go, well, let me ask some of the students how they think about this. Where, where do you don't feel safe in the parking lot? Oh, same place you don't. So again, we can start using that to make changes to what's already built. We can also use it because we've learned from what's built, the mistakes that might've been made or we find out later, we can address that in future construction. So we can start putting all this together, what we change at my school now to what we're gonna build in the future. And it makes it very cost effective in the long run. What would be some low cost or no cost examples I could easily incorporate at my school? Well, those are the best ones because I like hearing low cost, that's my favorite. So if I can just look at a site and go, you know, we're using this during the evening hours, you know, these lights aren't the best. You know, maybe we can just change out the bulb, switch it to LED. 
I can't look out my windows anymore to see where the kids are in the playground. Maybe if I trim that landscaping down underneath the windowsill, create a maintenance program with that, I can't look out the windows to see what's happening in the entryway. Well, let me move some of those posters over. Let me drop those down a bit. Uh, where do we have the kids gather for these events? Well, they've been going everywhere. Well, let me make a centralized location where they can meet so I can see what they're doing as a staff member. And if any student needs assistance, I can respond to that. How do we move the kids from, example, the uh, playground into the building? Well, I might change that direction now and use the windows I have for staff to overlook that movement as they come into my building. Let me add some color. And we all know how effective color is for a site. So let me add some color to that. So this way I can enhance learning, maybe adding some orange to that, maybe adding a variety of colors to really reflect some of that light in a positive way and have a calming effect on students. And those are easily done just by adding the paint. I can look at desk placement. I can look at the instructor's workstation orientation. How can they improve surveillance? They look at their kids. So again, there's a lot of cost-effective steps we can take early on to what we already have to make the change with what we have and improve that overall safety. All right, Stephen, one thing I want to talk about also is we've had discussion of this in some of the workshops is the uh, use of student artwork as a step head strategy. Uh, some of the research and what we've seen in the past is if we bring human form to a site, you know, bring the feeling of someone watching you, that there's a decrease in certain types of activity or negative activity, whether it's going to be vandalism or criminal vandalism, criminal mischief, uh, some theft, just the perception again, through that student artwork is having all the students up in the front looking and waving at people coming in. That partially serves as a deterrence where, hey, we see you, you're coming in, welcome to our school. But again, we want you to feel that we're all watching to help you in case you need assistance. Or that other side was, this is our space. Don't do anything here that's going to get everybody in trouble. So we set that up. Uh, we see a lot of cities under their public art initiative adding those facial forms to bring more eyes out and less vandalism, less criminal mischief activity, and just that perception of ownership. It's under the eyes of people using the space and it's proven to be very beneficial. It also adds color to the space, celebrates the entryway, creates a focal point, brings the attention to that. It's like, wow, that is very cool having the kids out here greeting you as you come in. But that perception, the feeling of surveillance doesn't have to be a real person if we can't do it every time but I can at least bring the form and shape of that as happening. We can also look at something called a positive activity generator. Now, bringing that artwork in is a positive activity generator. It activates the space visually. You know, now instead of a solid wall, I've got perception of movement, I've got color, I've got form. It stays busy and then my eyes transition into the building. If I have a spot, for example, on the exterior of my building, or I don't have a lot of surveillance, I don't have a lot of, I have some students here, but I can't see what they're doing. Not everyone, I'll try to bring a positive activity out. Maybe I'll turn it into a space for, uh, that we can share as part of sitting. Maybe I can look at a spot to park my bikes to bring more surveillance there. Uh, maybe I look at a spot out by the parking lot, for example, where I lock my bikes, I've got secured parking there. Maybe I've got a spot where you know, I can set up a coffee vendor on the outside or maybe purchase some items there in the parking lot or the spot that's further away because that forces pedestrians into the space to look to see what's going on and bring more eyes to that. Our goal is to make the normal users or people that use the space feel comfortable. You know, if something happens, people see me, they can respond. The same with someone that's coming there that might be looking at committing a, a crime. You know, oh, they saw me. Oh my God, there's no place I can go where there's not some kind of activity where students are watching me. I might add the PE jogging path around that, around that space. Tell the coaches, hey, look, you know, we've had some issues here. Can you run the kids around the sidewalk here for their morning jog? And that's going to bring more eyes. for the, And you know they're going to loiter a bit and talk to each other as they're running, but that's going to bring more surveillance out. Uh, maybe the tennis courts, again, maybe we can look at something here, maybe remove some of the screening on this side to bring more surveillance out. So there's a lot of little steps I can do. Provide seating, umbrella seating at a spot where kids are waiting for a bus. Well, we can sit there instead by the building, brings more eyes out into the parking lot. So we're activating the space in a positive way by providing amenities and encourage people to use that space and go to that space. That brings more eyes, less opportunity for crime, and more positive student social interaction. Are there assessments that I can use for my facility? Yeah, there's quite a few floating around there. The most current one is from the uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control. They came out with a true template for, for doing purely a SEPTED assessment. 
It has nothing to do with physical security. It is just strictly, where did my buses park? How do the students move from A to B? Uh, what about my green space? What kind of fencing do I have? And that's available online. Uh, the CDC has that. A few other states are creating templates. I know Georgia is working on one right now that is going to include a large septed component as part of their assessment. There's some you can purchase uh, that you can just kind of take a look online and Google it and say things that I can use to get the Texas School Safety Center way back what they were doing for their assessment tools. So there's a lot out there that are downloadable that you can use for free. I always recommend creating your own because no one knows your school is better than you do. So that really has an impact on how you create that template. Might use one as a model, but I'm going to tweak that to meet the needs of my schools and my staff and students. Do SEPTED principles apply at my home? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a good example, I like to look at my house. You know, we had a front porch and the landscaping sort of blocking the front porch and I couldn't see my neighbors anymore. So I trimmed that down. Uh, I had a bogan bee on the side. I let it get out of control. So now I couldn't see what my neighbor was cooking out in the backyard and go knock on his door. So again, those are little things I start looking at as well as far as the use to that and adding that to it as well. So I try to address those. Uh, but lighting, my front porch lighting is simple as that. Will I go with motion detectors or will I add that to the backyard? Uh, just little things, you know, the perception that someone's there, leaving the blinds open a certain degree, letting the light shine out. So uh, those things I can do, adding color. But if I go back to SEPTED, one thing that comes up a lot is maintenance. So for my home, the bed, as my home looks very well maintained in ownership, offenders are less likely to target my home. You know, again, if it looks like someone's there and that feeling, this is my space, you know, because we've been down to our neighborhoods, we're like, oh, is someone living there? The grass is pretty high. Are they on vacation? Is someone gone? Because the garbage can's been out for two or three days. So those little things make a big difference. And I can apply those in my home every day. Are there resources in my community to help me implement SEPTED principles? Now, there are some resources. I've seen some through the Department of Justice, and we're actually going to be working on this, trying to compile a, a page of where you can look for uh, funding, government grants and funding. Uh, DOJ provides quite a bit. I believe the CDC might have some programs out there. Uh, some of the universities are starting to sponsor uh, some programs for SEPTED, but it pretty much comes down to the state. You know, what does my capital tell me? You know, what is, for example, in Florida, what does Tallahassee tell us? Is there money available that we can start uh, providing funding to make some of the changes? It's almost like it's regional. You know, sometimes we have uh, our state reps or state house will provide funding. I know we worked on one on Maryland where they're going to be providing funding for park design and safety. So they created this big pot of money. And if you have a park they're going to use SEPTED for, then you can get the money to make the changes. So there are resources specifically for Oklahoma. I would probably look up Department of Justice first to see if there's funding available. I check the grants. If not, I just kind of, and I hate to say Google it. But uh, sometimes you just got to Google it and see what pops up and what's available to us. But I have seen where there is money available. What role do landscapers and maintenance teams play in implementing SEPTED at my school? Wow. Maintenance is probably the most important part. Uh, we do a series of workshops. We just did one last week, a five-day course. And when everybody presented, I asked them all, okay, out of all the things we saw, what is the thing that we could change and work on quickly to bring SEPTED to the site. And about 75% said maintenance. Maintenance by far is, is the most important. And we, we kind of lose track of that because we think, well, we have facility maintenance, I'll take care of that. But sometimes we pull them to do so many other things, we kind of forget the foundation when we go back into SEPTED. You know, do the lights still function? A landscape, again, ownership, pay, maintaining the doors, the cameras, uh, door locks, door time. So these are things we, have to look at. Once I have a program in place, we see a lot of these issues start to just fall away because now, again, that we're in control of the space. When I look at my landscapers, this is where working with the American Society and Landscape Architects, uh, sometimes we get so caught up on the landscaping, we, we want to add as much green as we can. And I, I like green. You know, again, it, it just makes the campus look vibrant, you know, adding the, the flowers to that and the plants. But going back to my two foot, six foot rule for SEPTED, you know, low ground cover, not to see two feet, higher true canopy, six feet and higher. 
when I work in my landscape park, I said, I want all the plants on my campus to have a maximum growth of two feet. So I want to be species specific. So this way we save money on maintenance. I don't have to trim them down every day because I know it's going to have a maximum growth two and two and a half feet. And when I bring my plants to the six foot uh, canopy and higher, my landscape architect can choose that early on during the design phase where I know it's going to be above the windows. I'm not going to have to deal with that right away. I'm not putting a, a new tree in front of my window that's going to block my view outwards. So landscapers play a huge part. And then they also fly back under maintenance. So again, both work so well together and working on some schools or conducting assessments of schools, that's probably the, the quickest thing you can address you know, and, and show success. You know, that's, let's have a maintenance plan first and let's just address that. And after that, people look and go, wow, what a difference. I'm like, yes, just these little things, landscaping maintenance make a big difference on a site. How can schools avoid creating a non-welcoming environment by hardening their target? Ah, that is the big one. Uh, working with uh, DHS and a few of the other groups, we're trying to blend in good design with target hardening. And this is where your role becomes so critical because you know security, we all know security, we know how to do that, but how do I aesthetically make it blend into the site? So if we're gonna go with bollards, for example, to uh, not allow vehicles to access the site, nothing says we can't decorate those bollards. Nothing says we can't have the students engage in that as part of it. If I'm gonna go with reinforced planters, you know, to not allow access, but to at least soften up the look of the entryway, I can let the students get involved in the design of that, adding some paint to that, adding maybe seniors, the year they're gonna graduate on it, to show that ownership too. So I can make it welcoming if I'm looking at lighting too. We don't want that harsh, you know, I don't wanna say prison quality, but institutional quality lighting. So we have offer shielding. We look at Kelvin temperature to soften up the look. We add the colors. We celebrate the entryway, get the school logo up there, create that sense of pride. So we can really blend physical security into the design phase and people don't even realize it's there. That's when we kind of smile and go, wow, we've been successful. No one sees the security that's right there in the building. And again, they sit on, they sit on the security, they interact next to the security, the ballers, the plant, everything is there. It just seems like, what an inviting campus. I really like being here. And even window, again, we look at laminate, we look at things we put on because we want the windows. We know windows improve learning. So again, why not keep them there, but use other technology to make those windows difficult to penetrate. And it's there. You know, sometimes you just have to spend a little bit of extra money, but the value of natural surveillance, the value of being able to see my kids waiting outside for their parents to pick them up, that is so critical us. So I can start blending all these together and be very successful. What are examples of natural surveillance? Natural surveillance, when we think about it, uh, placing activities that we can readily observe. So the first thing we look at is might be outdoor seating. You know, let's just kind of start on the exterior, work our way in uh, towards the perimeter coming in. Outdoor seating for my students, for staff to sit, decorative benches, you know, common areas that we share, we orient those in such a way to bring more surveillance outwards. Fencing, I always love to go decorative see-through fencing. You know, I, I, we have that argument, I don't want them to look into the school, and trust me, I understand that, but I want to be able to see who's approaching the school. I want to be able to see what my kids getting off the bus, you know, getting off cross street or kids biking, I want to see them. You know, if, if they need assistance, we can go. So again, I got to include that natural surveillance. So fencing ties into that also. Once I'm inside the uh, building itself or the school, where do I set up my reception area? Because that's, a, that's where we're most vulnerable is that main entry you come in. So I want to design it in such a way to improve that surveillance. So casual surveillance, my staff is working, they just look up and they can see, you know, who's walking up to the school 25, 30 feet away, all based on how I designed it and to improve that natural surveillance. My classroom design as well. I know... Sometimes it's distracting to have windows, but then I orient the classroom in such a way. So, you know, the kids are looking at the teacher, the teacher's looking at the kids and then looking out into the green space or looking out towards the entryway. So we can design the workstation to maximize that surveillance. But for us, nothing beats transparency, the ability to look out, to see what's taking place, whether it's in the hallway or the corridor. So again, I can see student movement and then designing the interior classroom in such a way that if I need to secure in place, no one can see where my, my students are sitting. So again, I can have some window placement, but a lot of thought goes into that, you know, the interior design. 
and still be able to look out and see, is it safe for us to exit? Is it safe for us to move the hallway? Does someone need help? Oh, there's my good friend, Mary. I haven't seen her for a while. So having surveillance isn't all about the negative. It's also about the positive. You know, oh, the kids are outside having a good time. Let's go join them. Oh, the kids are out there. Talk. Let's go and sit with them too. So surveillance is good too. It creates that, that interaction that we like to have. So we see something fun, we go to it to be part of it, or we see someone that needs assistance and we can respond to that as well. It's not all about catching offenders. It's all about those opportunities to do the positive as well. So yeah, natural surveillance is very important. And again, just something as simple as window placement makes a big difference. What effect does lighting have on school campuses? Lighting is huge. Uh, that There's so much going into it now. Kelvin temperature, uniformity levels, lux. I mean, when I got involved with lighting back in the 90s, I thought, well, we'll just put in a light bulb and we're good to go. Uh, a lot has changed since then. <laughs> so now with the uh, introduction of LED to everything that we see, one thing I always talk to people about is not all LEDs are good. You know, we know savings are there. We understand that. But then we get into the quality of light, you know, and because we're education, we want to have the, the proper light to encourage learning. So we get into Kelvin temperature. We've all seen those bright blue lights that sometimes hurt your eyes that we see it on properties. We see them on cars. Now I get up in that blue range. We call it the blue range. And I'm up to about 6,000 Kelvin, 5,000. And that's when I see that number on a site plan, a lighting survey, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of blue light. The American Medical Association had a study a couple of years ago, and they found uh, the best temperature for lighting is going to be about the 3,000 range. And that's a gives you a warm color, a warm glow, more of the uh, a little gold. I can still identify colors. Uh, most septic practitioners were about the 3,400 range for Kelvin. And again, that's just a very comfortable setting, a warm setting, you know, warm and inviting. Classroom, again, there's some studies out there. Uh, it's a new lighting program where they adjust the Kelvin temperature to improve learning in the classroom. So the, uh, once they go up a little bit on the blue of the light, uh, the whiter up on that range, probably about 4,000, 4,400, your print starts to stand out a little more clearly. Students respond to that differently. And they do show research where errors decrease by about 35% using that upgraded lighting. Then to relax the kids, they drop the temperature down to about 3,400. So it has a calming effect. Again, you feel in that warm light. And then again, they elevate it during hours when they're working on projects. So that's just to improve learning. For safety, nothing beats, again, pedestrian scale lighting, cutoff fixtures. We have the strategy of lighting where you need it. And if I just light the green space to help see who's approaching the school during the evening hours, that's all I need to light. Especially if I'm working on witness potential and my neighbor's looking in. If I'm looking at motion activation, what's the best light for my camera system too? So we have to cover that as well. I got state-of-the-art cameras, but I got really bad lighting. So that's gonna impact my ability to identify a car, to identify someone that might need assistance. So lighting is, that's why we always recommend setting lighting standards for each school, whether it's gonna be through the school district or whether it's gonna be through the state, but have a lighting standard that's easily identified. Any architect will come in and see that and go, okay, I know what I have to use for lighting. And you standardize that for every school it makes your job, everybody's job, a lot easier because there's no more guessing. This is what works best. Let's apply it here. What strategies would you recommend for signage at my school? For signage, there's two we look at. One is going to be mainly pedestrian scale. So again, I want it to be right at eye level. I always talk about making the decision, making easy for students or people that come to my school. Hey, check into the office before you enter. This is where you go through but still provide some transparency. So I don't want my signage to take up my whole window because I've seen that when we come into certain schools. Pedestrian scale at eye level. Once we start putting it up at that eight foot mark above the doorways, sometimes people just don't look at it, you know, because they want to see what's happening right here, right when they're walking in. So that I want to have good color, which brings their eyes to that, create that focal point. You know, we're just looking in on that. Use the right font size. You know, again, because not everybody has perfect vision going in. So I want the right font size that goes into that. And I want it to be very simple. You know, don't have to read three, four, five sentences into that before you realize, oh, I got to check in at the desk. Now, because they're only get to number two and they're like, okay, that's enough. I'm going. 
Well, now they made a mistake and staff has to respond to their movement. We clutter sometimes with too much signage and information. So we try to make the decision e making easy. Now for schools coming in, like the monument sign, you know, right up in the front, have it where you can see identified as you're driving in, you're coming onto my school now. But that monument sign, I have to look at lighting. I always like a gap in it, if at all possible, from the base of the sign. So you have surveillance as you drive by. I know it's on the other side of it. And we want to soften it up with landscaping in many cases. So allow some low ground cover. If I've got one eight feet high, that's a big difference. I throw in an electronic board, that's even better because now I get the messages out. You can see it from far away. So if we have new programs today, must check into office, we're at a level B today. I can see that before I even get onto the school ground. So now I'm aware and I start looking rather than get there. Hey, what's going on? Didn't you read the sign? What sign? No, no, no. Again, so it's kind of confusing. So keep it simple, get the signage up, but make it bright, make it vibrant. That's the best. And it shows that ownership. This is my school. What does it mean to become a SEPTED professional? A SEPTED pro, that is a good one. Uh, I'm still learning. I always learn. I've come across some assessments and I'm like, wow, I wish I would have thought of that because people are just bringing a variety of backgrounds and experiences in. But to get a designation, and, and we talked about this for some time. We talked about it in my state as well, uh, in, in Florida. And we finally said, okay, what's a minimum standard we can all identify that if you take this training, you can work on our project. And it allows those in the industry to hire people because they go, well, where are your training at? Well, I took it from this and I've earned this designation. Oh, okay. Well, then you met those minimum requirements. So yes, you can be part of the team rather than, yeah, I took a two hour course. I took a four hour course. And are they at your level again? Because coming through a lot of our training, the six, you have a pretty good grasp of doing an assessment of understanding codes, lighting, human behavior, you know, you bring all that to play instead of someone who took two hours ago. I know what SEPTED stands for. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. Then I cramp it. We got to really read into it. So to get that designation, whether it's from us or overseas or some of the other group, I'm always going to say from us, but it at least lets everyone know they know this. They should know this. They know how to read site plans. They have an understanding of that. They can apply it and work with us quickly. And because it encompasses all the states. It's not state specific. You know, it's not just for Texas or Oklahoma or, or California. These overlap. So when I move from state to state or work with architects from outside the state, we're on the same playing field. We understand the concepts. We can explain them to each other very well. We know each other's language. So earning a designation or a professional status really brings you on the same level of those others that are involved in creating a safe school environment. I would again like to thank Mr. Art Hushin for joining us on our safety and security series on SEPTED. And for any of one of you that would like for us to come and do a walkthrough and talk to you on how to apply these SEPTED principles, you can contact us or find us on the web at sde.ok.gov or contact me personally, stephen.lynch at sde.ok.gov. Thank you.